The government shutdown is over, for now. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I am David Hansen, joined by Fool One analyst Morgan Hazel. Thanks for being back, Morgan. Thanks for having me. Our first headline of the day, what else could it be? Got to go with the government shutdown. It is from the Washington Post. It is just simply government reopens. Morgan, was there just irreparable damage from this that the economy is never going to recover from? Uh, it will recover from it, but there's definitely damage from it. So there are two estimates about how much the shutdown costs the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, one from a firm call, called Macroeconomic Advisor says it was about $12 billion is what the 16-day shutdown cost. Big. It's pretty big. The other one is from S&P. They use a little more comprehensive model. They think it costs about $24 billion, mm -hmm. which I did the math this morning. It's about a million dollars a minute that the government was shut down, that it cost the economy from furloughing employees. Because remember, a lot of the government employees, 700,000 that were furloughed and laid off, they, they will be owed back pay. We still have to pay them. Mm -hmm. They didn't do any work for 16 days, so it's a direct cost added mm -hmm. to the economy. And then there's, there's less spending from government contractors, there, and it goes on down the line. So it costs quite a bit of money, certainly more money than we got out of uh, the budget deal, which was effectively nothing. Mm -hmm. So we, we obviously saw the stock market jumping around a little bit. I don't even know if... Overall, over the course of the government shutdown, what did the did the market even was, go down? It was, up, was it? it was actually up, up. about two percent, but it, it 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 hopped around during the last sixteen days. But for any anyone out there that that sold shares of anything, whether it be an index fund, a company, do you think that was just completely nuts? And yes, why would anyone ever do that? Yes, I absolutely do. I, I you know my my litmus test is that your trading decisions should be based around your long-term goals. Mm -hmm. When do you want to retire, send your kids to school or something like that? You should almost never be trading around news headlines and mm -hmm. especially political headlines that are short-term driven and don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be different if, you know, you know, someone got nuclear bombed or something. That might be a political headline that you should mm -hmm. act on. Right. But we're talking about government shutdown, politics, elections. It is almost never wise to base your trading decisions around that. All right, moving on to the next headline. There were some companies that were still functioning, and Goldman Sachs was one of them. Goldman Sachs net flat as fix, fixed income slumps through expenses. Though expense, expenses dropped 25%. That is the worst headline I've ever read in my life, Wall Street Journal. Uh, so Goldman Sachs reported this morning, not a lot of surprise here. We saw a lot of invest, investment banks come out and say, fixed income trading is going to be lower. And just some to clear that up with some listeners and some viewers, fixed income trading is not Goldman Sachs making prote proprietary bets and making risky bets with their right. own money. This is client-driven activity. And during this shutdown that we just talked about, a lot of clients sitting on the sidelines, not trading government securities, not trading other fixed income instruments. So this isn't a problem with Goldman Sachs, with Goldman Sachs during the quarter. It was really an industry-wide problem. I don't think it's a reason to be concerned. Right, and that big decline in fixed income too, uh, that's that's pretty normal if you look back over a multi-year period. Mm -hmm. Trading in, uh, in, in w with all types of products, bonds especially, can be very volatile. And a lot of people look at investment banks like Goldman Sachs and say, why does it trade at such a low multiple? Mm -hmm. The reason, by and large, is because the revenues like from fixed income can be very volatile over mm -hmm. time. It's not a steady thing that you can rely on quarter after quarter. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of these companies end up trading at lower valuation multiples. I, I think it's, I mean, that's definitely true, but you, ca you cannot look at one quarter right. and say, this means the business is not performing well compared to others. I think it's a very cyclical business. So there will be quarters where Goldman Sachs fixed income trading is awesome compared to this. So uh, I'm a Goldman Sachs shareholder and I think it is trading at a low multiple. I, I don't think it's going to get back to pre-crisis levels, but I think it's still a strong franchise. You look at the IPOs that are coming out, Twitter IPO, lead underwriter, Goldman Sachs, the Verizon Vodafone deal, advisor on that, Goldman Sachs. So across the board, the business is still performing well. It's hard to do anything in high finance without getting Goldman Sachs involved. Exactly. All right, moving on to the final headline. This isn't from today, but it's from a couple days ago from Bloomberg. Fama, Schiller, Hansen, that is not me, that's a different Hansen, win Nobel Prize for asset price work. I was actually I hoping that was you. I'm, was I'm a little disappointed now. It's spelled differently, though. There's an E, <laughs> not a no. Uh, so this was, this was in the news the other day. People were saying two different schools of thought here. This doesn't make sense. What are your thoughts? Should investors even care about this? Or yeah, what's so, the deal so here? The, the really quick background is that in the 1960s, Eugene Fama did some work to show that the market is usually very efficient and that mm -hmm. it's very hard to beat because investors price in all the known news. Robert Schiller, starting in the 1980s, did a little bit different work and he showed, look at market moves over time are driven by investor behavior and investor psychology and a lot of times it can be, it, it can be very inefficient. Mm -hmm. 
so a lot of people have been talking about in the last couple of days, do those two kind of cancel each other out? And it's weird that these two are sharing the Nobel mm -hmm. Prize where it seemed like contradictions. It's not really when you think that Fama's work really shows that the market is efficient most of the time. Mm -hmm. Schiller's work shows that it is inefficient some of the time. Right. So those aren't mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, there's no, it, it's not as black and white as some people are. And these two weren't, this wasn't for joint work, correct? And this is for two separate studies, correct? It was for, or, or, for, for, for three different studies. Right, yeah. three. They were, all had to do with the efficiency of the market mm -hmm. or lack thereof. But yeah, as far as I know, none of these three economists ever, ever worked together. All right, moving on to our next segment here, taking a little bit of a deeper look at earnings season. And it can, be, it can be exciting. We just talked about the headlines at Goldman Sachs, the headlines of other companies, stock can drop 5 10%. Do you think investors should really be tuned into earnings season? Is this a chance to, to kind of get a gaze into the company? How is it performing? Or do you think investors should just kind of say, eh, w whatever, it's a quarter? You know, I think for companies that you own, it's important to glance at quarterly earnings. But mm -hmm. I think was what is much more important over time is the trend in earnings. There's not a lot that can happen that is very significant in 90 days to a large global business. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're looking at over the course of a year or two, what's the trend in earnings? How is the business doing? That's much more important than drilling down on numbers mm -hmm. in a 90-day period to see how, how something's done. There's going to be a lot of natural volatility in there. Right. And it's tempting to think that that is a signal and say, oh, look, at revenues decline 1% or whatever, and that's significant, when it might not be significant at all. Right, and I would, I would almost challenge someone to go out there and the first reaction when a company reports earnings is, you look at the headline, it might sound good, it might not sound good. Then you look at the stock, pre-market or wherever it's trading in the first couple hours, and it's down. And then you make your decision, oh, it was a bad quarter right. for that company. For an example, I looked at, at eBay this morning, and before the bell opened, before I, I looked at the stock market, I thought, well, this is a pretty good quarter for eBay. PayPal continues to have strong growth. The marketplace is, is growing well. And then I clicked over to, to Google Finance, just curious, and the stock was down 5%. And I, that was just an example of, don't let the market paint your view of what the quarter is. If the business is still growing, if there isn't a fundamental change in the business, I don't think you should think anything of right, it. Right, you know, there's two things there. One is that a lot of stock movements over time are, are driven not necessarily by company fundamentals, mm -hmm. but fundamentals in relation to valuation. Mm -hmm. so if the company is really expensive, even if the company is doing well, uh, that that could hurt the stock price over mm -hmm. time. And the other thing is that so many Wall Street traders are focused on the next 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, and their reaction might be totally different than yours as a mm -hmm. long-term investor. Right, and I've got, I've got a real-life example here of how kind of pointless earnings season are, and we talk about banks a lot here on this show. And if someone was to come to you and said, hey, 20 years ago, I bought a bank that grows book value at an average rate, or at a, a compound rate of 2% a quarter. Doesn't sound great. I mean, two percent. It's okay. Every quarter you look at it and say, another two percent. Okay, whatever. Uh, but over time, two percent a quarter compounded over twenty years, that turns into almost five hundred percent. Right. So these quarters can seem like they're nothing. Two percent, great. But over twenty year period, which is which is a long time, but not inconceivable. That's if you were holding a good company for twenty years. That's a realistic uh, time period there. Five hundred percent. And this is a real life example with M and T Bank. They grew book value, tangible book value, at around 2% a quarter. And the total return of the stock, including dividends, uh, including price appreciation, over 1,000% over 20 years. So not a bad return. I would take that. And the interesting point of it was, on average, around once every five quarters, tangible book value per share actually fell. Uh, yeah. So almost once a year, you had a quarter where tangible book value per share fell, and you'd think, man, this is terrible, the business is declining. But over that long period of time, they continue to grow, Degree. and you get great returns there. So I thought that was an interesting example of just how stupid it is to look at these quarterly performances. And on, 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 on a similar note, it's, it's the same in the stock market over time. So it's from 2002 to 2012, Apple increased 9,000%. Mm -hmm. Its shares declined on almost 50% of trading days. Right. So there's, there's often a big difference between, obviously, what goes on in mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day versus the long uh, line of history. Absolutely. All right, moving on to the game for the day. And we usually rank companies here. What do we think is the most attractive? What do we think is the most exciting? But we're being a little bit depressing today. And we're ranking the five worst common mistakes that investors make. Uh, I'll throw them out there in no particular order here. They are overlooking fees, trading too much, focusing, focusing on the short, for, short term or short run, not saving enough, and thinking volatility means something important. Right. So 
we have a graphic of your of your rankings, and I'll let you go first. Yeah, and, and you know, so you had said that, that, that this is sort of depressing. I really don't think it's depressing. Mm-hmm. For me, as investing, the most important thing people should focus on is not how to get better, it's how to get less bad. Mm-hmm. That's, that, 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 that's one of the big themes that I really hammer on. Mm-hmm. That's how most people can become a better investor, is to mm-hmm. focus on their mistakes. So not saving enough. Uh, that's been, your number one. There, yeah, there have been a lot of studies that show, even if you look back at hindsight, and you would say, okay, here's here's Sally Jane, she's 65, she wants to retire. Mm-hmm. She doesn't have very much money. She, she doesn't have enough money to retire. Even in hindsight, let's go back and say she was basically a perfect investor and invested just like she should, dollar cost average, you know, didn't, didn't bail out at the lows and jump mm-hmm. in at the highs. She was a perfect investor. Even if she did that, she still would not have enough money to retire because mm-hmm. she just didn't save enough throughout her, her career. Mm-hmm. And that is true for more than 50% of retirees that have a shortfall at age 65. Mm-hmm. The reason that they have so little money is because they didn't save enough. It wasn't because they made bad investment decisions. Right. So I think for most uh, most investors, most retirees, you, you will you will do better for your retirement by focusing on how, on how you can save more money rather than how can rather I than invest trying to better. Pick. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, that's where you're, you're really going to make some hay mm-hmm. and make a big difference in the long run is by focusing on how to save more money. All right, what do you got for, for two and three worst mistakes investors make? I, I think, and th- this might be tied for my number one in the short run, uh, is, uh, for my number one, is focusing on the short run. Mm-hmm. I think there's, uh, there's an epidemic in, in America throughout the politics to investing mm-hmm. of short-term thinking. There's a really great, great quote from Larry Fink who runs BlackRock. He was having lunch with the CEO of one of the world's largest pension funds funds. And the CEO said that his, uh, his goal in the pension fund was to uh, think generationally. And then Larry Fink said, so how do you measure your returns? Mm-hmm. He said, quarterly. Of course. <laughs> so I mean, and there's a lot of that that goes on with individual investors mm-hmm. too. Someone like me or you, we're not going to retire for 30, mm-hmm. 35 years, something like right. that. But I check my portfolio almost every day. You mm-hmm. probably do too. Mm-hmm. There's no reason for that, but we still do it. And it influences how we think about the market mm-hmm. in a detrimental way over time. Right. I was going to, you mentioned that was tied for two. If we kick over to my rankings, I, I did have focusing on the short run a little bit before saving it. You made a good case for saving, so maybe I'll give that 1A or 1B. Uh, so yeah, I thought the short run as well. And you mentioned looking at the portfolio every day, and I know some people, m- my normal co-host, Matt Copenheffer, says he looks at his once a quarter, maybe, once a month. And I think there are some people that say that's, that's great. Other people say looking at it each day is really bad. I don't necessarily agree that I think it's very bad to look at your portfolio every day. If it's going to affect you emotionally and you really just can't take it if your portfolio drops a couple of percentages a day, then I think it's bad. But I think it's good to be aware of what you're holding and kind of what's the performance been in those holdings. Because you want to be aware of if something's underperforming, if you made it a wrong decision here. And I think that highlights the other things that we have on this list in terms of trading too much and, and fees. Um, I think it ties into that in terms of focusing on the short run. You can focus on the short run in a good way, I think, but not in terms of trying to, to time the market and say, now's the time to buy, now's the time to sell. So I had it at number one, but it's a little bit of a caveat in terms of what's bad about it and what's good about it there. Right. And I would say fees too, that's almost the opposite in that fees are something that usually don't affect you that much in the short run. It's mm-hmm. compounded over the decades that fees really kill you. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people look at a mutual fund and say, oh look, it has a, a, a 1% annual fee and that's mm-hmm. not that much. And you're right, in one year, a hundred, you know, 1% is not that much. Mm-hmm. It's $100 for every $10,000 you invest, uh, which doesn't seem like that much. But if you compound that over 20 years, it's gonna add up to a huge portion of your mm-hmm. returns that's gonna go to your investment advisor that most likely did not earn you superior returns over time. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a great book written in the 1940s called Where Are the Customers' Yachts? And that really explains everything you need to know about fees. Mm-hmm. Where are the customers' yachts? We know where Wall Street's yachts are. Mm-hmm. Where are the customers' yachts? That's what fees That's what fees do to your portfolio over time. Right. The one that you had down there at number four, I think, in term is investors think volatility means something important. Right. What do you mean by that? So I, I think there are a lot of people that think that if the stock market falls 100 points or the stocks in their portfolio fall 2%, that that means something, that that's a signal that something is going bad. So the Dow drops 100 points and people mm-hmm. jump to a conclusion that says that means the economy is slowing down or that means investors think this and think that. Mm-hmm. And there's really no rhyme or reason for the vast majority of those moves. What, what, what the news headline should say is Dow fell 100 points because sometimes that just happens once <laughs> right. in a while and that's just what it does. Mm-hmm. But it's really tempting for the media especially to link a 
causation to every little blip in the market. And that too just, just screws with our head and thinks that there's so much more going on that means something when it's really just random and we really shouldn't be paying so you mean, attention So you mean it. China's PMI is not the end all be all of, of where the market's going? Basically. If that's lower, that's not the indicator. Right. Maybe just, right. maybe the market decided to be down for a day. Exactly. All right, um, I think that rounds it out. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the next segment here on the Twitter sphere, closing it out how we always do. Our first tweet is from Eddie Elfenbein. It says, the recovery is four years old. Predictions of a double dip are 3.997 years old. It never came. And so my question about this is, at what point, if we, we're going to have another recession. I mean, right. that's, it happens. It's what, every 10 years or so on average? That would be on, on average, it's more like every seven to eight mm -hmm. years. But that, that doesn't mean that every exactly seven to eight years we're going right. to have one. That's just the long term average. At, at there what, have been periods, at, you know, during the 1990s, we went, right. we, we, we went mm -hmm. more than 10 years without mm -hmm. a recession. At, at what point does the next recession? no longer be considered a double dip. I mean, that, when that, when do we get out of that? So, yeah. so the, the Great Recession, as they call it, ended mm -hmm. in June 2009. So mm -hmm. we're more than four years away from that. So if we had another recession right now, it would just be a new recession rather mm -hmm. than a double dip recession. And so I, I yes, we're going to have more in the future. But there's no, there's no economic model or, for, or system or economist that mm -hmm. can forecast the next recession with any accuracy. I think history has really proven that beyond any reasonable doubt. So we know we're going to have it. We really just don't know when. Uh, and and we're just waiting around. I think it was interesting. You mentioned what the Great Recession ended in what June? June two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Yeah. If we try to think back to June two thousand nine, it's not like everything was was rosy back then. Things were still awful right. back then. I mean, I was I, I did a, a a TV spot for Fox News local uh, the other week, and the anchor said, "Well, we're just getting out of this recession." And it made me think there's a lot of people that still think things are really bad. And if you would have had that mindset yeah. and pulled all your money out of the stock market until you really felt good about the economy, say, now things feel good and would have waited to invest then, you would have completely missed, missed everything, everything that happened here. Right. So that, that's Buffett's quote when he was talking about this. He said, if you, if you wait for the robin, spring will be over. And that's, it's the same in the economy. If you wait until the economy is strong, you're going to miss a stock market rally yep. by years. All right, moving on to the next tweet from Carl Richards, who you interviewed last week, correct? Yep. All right, he is at Behavior Gap. He said, just listened to eight of the most successful people I know talk about their careers, dot, 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 the common thread, luck. That's right. Do you have to have luck? I, I, I think if you look at all successful people, they'll have some element of luck. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not saying that they weren't brilliant or earned mm -hmm. their success or whatnot, but I think in a lot of things in life, especially investing and businesses, we systematically underestimate the role of luck. Uh, and it leads us to think, well, this person did X, so I, if I do X, I'll have the same result as them, when that's really not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, it, it really just go, it, it, his point, Carl's point, really just underlines uh, how much random chance plays in markets and that we shouldn't be looking at what's going on and thinking mm -hmm. that it predicts the future. And, and what's, the, what's the quote about about luck, or, or is, it, is it luck or is it skill that the measure of whether there's luck involved is whether you can try to lose on purpose, Whether you can correct? lose on purpose. So if you gave Michael Jordan a basketball and said, miss every shot, mm -hmm. he could do it. Right. He could miss every single shot. But if you gave even Warren Buffett uh, a, a list of a thousand companies and said, pick 10 of these that are going to be down in one year, mm -hmm. he couldn't do it. Right. And that's because there is a large element of luck in investing. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the final tweet of the day from the dumb money at the dumb money. 99% of long-term investing is doing nothing. Is it really that easy? I think that's, I think that's really is quite that easy. Yeah, I think the vast majority of investors, if you just buy a diversified portfolio of stocks or a cheap index fund mm -hmm. and hold it for 20 or 30 years, you'll do fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and you can spend all that extra time that professional investors were sitting in front of their computer, in front mm -hmm. of their Bloomberg terminal. You can go to the beach and spend time with their kids and do whatever you want to do mm -hmm. and end up with more money than them in the end. So you mentioned earlier in the show that people should be buying and selling for, for life events if you're retiring, if you need the income, yeah. et cetera. You, a, a large portion of your portfolio is in index funds. Do you look at those and say, there's nothing that could make, make me sell these? Until until I need to for a life event, or do you do you give yourself the opportunity to say I think the market's overvalued? I'm going to reduce 
my exposure to index funds. What is your position there? Do you just buy them and lock them in the drawer until you're 60 years old? That's that's essentially my plan too. I, I mean, it's not a rock solid plan. Mm -hmm. If if we were back in 1999 and the and stocks were trading at obviously just nosebleed crazy mm -hmm. valuations, I'd like to think that yes, I would do something about mm -hmm. it then. But I've, I've never been in that position. I was too young to be investing in 1999, so I don't know how I would react to that. I hope I would. Mm -hmm. So that I would say that is uh, that's my plan, but it's not it's not written in stone. But otherwise, you're just I don't, keeping it in the drawer. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with it, you know. And I have cash too, so mm -hmm. when the stocks so when stocks plunge, I'll add to it, but mm -hmm. certainly not won't be selling right. any of it anytime soon. Well, well, we will be watching what you do next time, and we're going to hold you accountable. I like it. it. All right, perfect. Well, thanks for being here, Morgan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you are listening, or if you are watching, we are now on iTunes and Stitcher in a podcast form. We'll be back here tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.